Alrighty, hello every folks, and good morning. Ah, you love the smell of a good indie in the morning. And today we're t doing a preview of Tenderfoot Tactics. Now, to assuage a little bit of confusion here, um, yes, this is a preview for a game that technically has been out for a while. However, today it came out on Switch, so I have an excuse. So, uh, what exactly is this game? Because this is probably one of the strangest looking strategy games that you've ever seen. Um, and it's definitely one of the trippiest. So, let's go ahead and get into it here. So, Tenderfoot is, believe it or not, an open-world exploration TRPG that effectively has you playing as ghosts collecting plants. That might take some explanation, so, yeah. Anyway, also there's skiing, so let's go ahead and uh, start covering this a little bit. So, here's the general deal. Uh, you are playing as a bunch of goblins. These goblins, uh, they've lost their home. Uh, and in fact, they're probably ghosts, I think. It, it was a little unclear, to be honest. But um, they are traveling around attempting uh, to get their home back from this fog that's just kind of everywhere. Now, in the course of doing so, they will evolve past their normal goblin forms into all kinds of different things, and that's where you get your different classes. In fact, the way that this game handles a lot of its mechanics is really darn interesting. Um, and there's this kind of interesting, kind of like a... I don't know, it's got a very unique headspace in terms of uh, specifically wanting to, uh, to make you think about, well, forgetting. Uh, to make you think about uh, just kind of the weird, uh, I guess, just weird existence of everything that's going on around here. It's, again, a very meditative kind of experience um, it, that's honestly a little bit hard to describe. Uh, early on, for example, there were several cases where, uh, where we ran into characters that I believe are more of the gods of this particular universe. Essentially, just gigantic, lanky, I don't know what you'd call them, uh, kind of situations that would lurk over a fight staring above it at you, um, Essentially, just asking if you're aware, like, have you ever thought about how uh, how cozy chaos can be sometimes? You know, it's it's, it's a pretty cool thing. You know, maybe uh, maybe just think about the fact that maybe nothingness could potentially matter. Like, it's again a very strange experience where your boss fights are more so meditative experiences, more so than actual. You know, like. I mean, to say that it's not punishing wouldn't be accurate. It does have some pretty difficult fights, but. It's, uh, it seems to be all about the headspace here, so let's go ahead and cover the gameplay loop. Effectively, it works a little bit like this, that you will find a location, uh, and essentially... Oh, wow, this is new. Huh. <laughs> okay, so, you'll find a location to go set up a camp. In this case, this was a place to rest. We tried to uh, rest inside of it. And apparently it was very busy in here, <laughs> so in this case, uh, we're going to try to fight our way through, presumably through a lot of very chaotic stuff. Um, anyway, so you'll find, let's say, you know, a boss fight or an encounter or, you know, just a random god just kind of sitting there hanging out. And uh, you'll be asked if you want to start an encounter and you can go ahead and start it. Every fight has a lot of things going on. Uh, every single one of these attacks, for example, will have an elemental component. Some of them uh, will, for example, be fire, and they'll set the ground on fire. That guy's thing uh, has, uh, has water right there, and it made a little bit of water appear on the ground. Believe it or not, this is a mechanic. If the earth guy, uh, for example, goes and creates a hole like that, and the water guy fills up the water hole, and they do this a couple of times, the area is now essentially too deep for anyone to stand in. The height of your characters actually matters in this one, because the little guys, like the casters, or your basic goblins and things like that, will be too short to actually uh, be able to effectively fight in the water if it gets deep enough. Uh, or you've got other cases uh, where, let's say, these uh, we've got stuff like these, uh, these fire arrows over here, and if we make the area dry enough, uh, we would be able to go set a lot of things on fire. In this case, I'm going to go ahead and take an attack right here. Actually going to get a damage bonus against my own guy due to a terrain advantage, but his fire will be put out immediately because of where he is, and additionally there's a decent chance he actually might level up from this right here, which instantly gives him a free heal. Um, the tactics in this game are very, very satisfying. Um, it uses everything despite presenting everything in a really chaotic manner. Um, Basically, this is one of those games where, yes, you are definitely intended to try and figure stuff out for yourself, but the utter experimentation here is really, really cool. So I've been, I've been really loving that. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's quite a bit going on here, uh, mechanically speaking. Um, 
and frankly, a lot of the uh, a lot of things like this, like the uh, the damage over time effect and stuff like that, just feel really solid. And once again, open up a lot of very interesting doors. So, for example, uh, you'll notice those guys are taking DOT damage uh, in the background there. You can actually delay turns to get more damage out of your poison when they're going off in the background. Enemies still suffer from poison while they're going and spending time during their turn, and you can have those cool situations where you're in a boss fight, the boss comes up to you, they're about to squad wipe you, and suddenly they just keel over dead. It's really, really satisfying. So yeah, the, the mechanics here, uh, if you were, if you potentially held off on uh, picking this one up due to confusion over mechanics or whatever else, oh, they're solid. They're really darn <laughs> cool, actually. Um, there was, like, there's a lot more here than, uh, than I expected, for sure. Um, let's go ahead and charge this guy, I guess. Uh, not really how I was intending to go with that turn, uh, but uh, one of the quirks of this game is actually the fact that you don't have a back button. Um, so if you take a turn, you're committed. Like, if you take an action towards any particular direction, you are... you're in it now. <laughs> so, anyway. Also, interestingly enough, uh, that is a whole lot of tree tiles that showed up. We actually might be able to use that to our advantage, but for the moment, let me see if I can just go ahead and uh, poisonify these guys. There we go. Actually, I probably should have gone for the health stealing move. Oh well. Yeah, funnily enough, the health stealing move, uh, the thirst move, actually makes somebody thirsty enough that they actually will sap water off the ground. It's just a cool touch. Um, but yeah, let's actually cover a cross-classing real, uh, real quick, because there is actually quite a bit of cross-classing. Everyone starts off as what these guys are, uh, goblins. Now, despite being, you know, the basic goblin class, you'll oftentimes find yourself circling back to their abilities with every other class that you run into, because they, they as they say in the description, actually have one of the best skill sets in the game. Um, they just don't have that much of a health bonus, and they're just the basic class. In fact, you actually probably could run this game full goblins, as far as I've been able to tell, and probably be just fine. So, either way, just because they don't have an absolute ton of health doesn't really mean that they're, uh, that they're not a potentially amazing unit. Anyway, so... Actually, can I maybe... Is he going to join in the chart? Actually, no. Here, let's uh, let's go ahead and multi-action this. I want to... Uh, one of the cool things you can do is actually do uh, team attacks uh, with uh, uh, with this guy right here. So we're just going to go ahead and charge forward with both of them. Um, like I said, very unusual strategies, but you're going to be making use of a lot of stuff you wouldn't expect to be making use of. Uh, like, man, those multi-attacks just feel so good. Ah, oh, it's so satisfying. But there's always callbacks to those earlier classes. Like, you'll notice that knight pulled out, I think it was either a bow or a uh, slingshot to actually fire, which might seem like a little bit of a weird thing. Why is he, why is he doing that? So, in his particular case, at one point, he was a goblin. Uh, he was just a basic goblin like everybody else, and uh, at, th at that time, he had gone ahead and he used whatever weapon he came with. You don't actually equip your weapon, your people with, uh, with weapons directly, you equip them with trinkets. Um, so, uh, whenever he went and uh, decided to go, uh, uh, go switch into a different class, he still kept his original, uh, you know, original weapon with him somewhere. So he just kind of had it in his back pocket. Uh, and so, yeah, every time that, for example, he's using his uh, his uh, opportunist ability, uh, which tells him that uh, he can make a basic attack towards anything that goes nearby him, uh, he will still pull out his original weapon. And I mentioned earlier that there's an, kind of an interesting meditative uh, look at just forgetfulness in general, just kind of like forgetting the world around you and kind of accepting that things just are as they are sometimes whatever you'd call that. It's a very interesting mood that they're going for here. Um, an interesting aspect to all that is the fact that you can forget a lot of your original abilities for the purpose of improving yourself. Uh, so, for example, the, uh, the uh, basic goblin there, they can just forget their ability to attack something in order to pick up opportunist instead. <laughs> so, that's kind of been my go-to as far as uh, standard uh, kind of starting actions for the team. Um, so I just love to see that. Also, uh, are we going to rest here? Yeah, let's go ahead and take a nap. Um, there's a quick little side note on this. Uh, there's not really a logistics aspect. Uh, basically, whenever you rest at a spot, that's just your new respawn point. So if you lose a fight, um, you can either retry the fight or go back to a previous location. Or if you're playing on some of the other difficulties, you will just respawn at this location and you will use some of your goblins that you've freed. So every time you win a fight, you're actually freeing some of those goblins and they're going to show up at your last uh, uh, last town that you've set up. Um, 
and you set these up all over the place, right? So wherever your home point is, that's where you'll spawn in with more people. So every random fight, again, just gives you more units. And so you use these generics, you uh, you carry around a team of a maximum of six, and you travel the world. And if you wanted to play with permadeath, that's an option. In fact, I know we haven't covered all the other aspects yet, but the difficulties here are very Felsial-esque uh, in terms of uh, how they're actually completely thought out. Um, so, like, you start off on Classic, uh, where you start off with the default unnerve mechanic. Uh, you have no, uh, no permadeath, uh, a maximum team size, which stays the same for all of them, um, a difficulty modifier that's normal, and you're allowed to retry things. So it's, you know, recommended for a first time. Um, and as it mentions here, it features dynamic difficulty adjustment and generally is balanced to present all players with a good challenge when played on Classic. So, you know, either way, that... <sighs> Granted, I probably should have read that before leaving it on Rowdy forever, but anyway. So Rowdy's the one that I've been playing uh, on mostly. Uh, it basically gives you one less a nerve. We haven't covered that yet because I want to cover it uh, in just a second here. Uh, with, you know, no permadeath, fights are 20% harder, but retries are permitted. Then we get into uh, to Iron here, wherein uh, units will be permanently dead after three, uh, uh, three wounds. Um, and again, it's it's 20% uh, higher, but the unnerve is left by default, and I love how the highest difficulty also leaves that at default. This is the only one that actually changes the unnerve mechanic, and I was kind of kicking myself upon realizing that, uh, because frankly, either one of these two is probably what I would have been playing it on this whole time. I just thought that it would just keep adding more unnerve. So, essentially... What Unnerve is, uh, the the Unnerve and uh, Promote mechanic, uh, which actually I'm just going to go ahead and uh, switch it to uh, the Classic, because I want to try out this Dynamic Difficulty. Um, so, uh, which, which actually I have seen some Dynamic Difficulty going on, don't get me wrong. But what Unnerve is, is that if a unit is attacked from the front, in most cases, uh, they will actually act faster uh, than they would have normally. So they actually will promote their turn up in the turn order. If a unit is flanked, or if they're hit from the back, depending on the severity of that flank, uh, they will actually end up going and getting their turn knocked backwards. In fact, that's what I really love about these uh, uh, these uh, knight characters right here. At one point I was running a full team of knights, because they have the ability to insult somebody and lo at long range which takes their basic weapon attack, insults somebody at long range, and potentially adds an additional plus three on nerve on there uh, to uh, to knock their uh, their turn order way back. Oh, what the hell are you? I have no idea what that is. That's just a dude with a cool looking sword. I kind of want to fight him. Huh. Very, uh, very unusual looking dude. Um, you know what? Let's go ahead and cover a few more mechanics and then I want to fight that guy. Also, ski mechanic. <laughs> Anyway, um, okay, hold on. Let's go ahead and see uh, the little flashing thing over there is a level up icon. I always have my uh, little Alphonse on the shelf down there, <laughs> um, but it just kind of happened to line up in that location. So if you wanted to, um, at any point you can forget any of your basic goblin skills and then invest those points into something else. However, um, you, as you travel along, you collect these Fey Weed things, which allow you to respec somebody into something, into uh, into a, a different thing. Now. In their particular case, I just kind of want to keep things going. So, let's see, they should already have all of these. These are the only two that they can learn. And so, with our polearm specialist over here, it's interesting that they're a mix of, like, the, uh, the FFT Bard, as well as Dragoon, um, as well as a few other things. So, like, they can uh, they can uh, go and uh, jump uh, to go hit somebody in a splash, kind of like the FFTA Dragoon, actually. Um, you have somebody, you have your standard uh, Skewer, which your standard one just allows you to attack at two tiles, but then from there on out, you can improve the damage, or you can hit both those tiles at the same time. Um, or you've got uh, things like Inspire, where all enemies that are within range uh, are inspired, uh, which makes unnerve hit them less, so if you're being constantly knocked back in the turn order, uh, this would cause them to ignore the effect of that a decent bit, um, also give them immunity to knockbacks for a round, um, and addition, well, not one round, but uh, 480 ticks. As you've noticed, game ticks are pretty important in this one. Um, and then charge, which allowed him to uh, team up with uh, nearby, enemy, uh, nearby allies and kind of charge forward, as it were. Uh, or we've got our uh, battle mage over here doing things like uh, smoothing out the earth nearby them and breaking away any uh, any obstacles while also healing their allies, which I'm probably going to go for here. Um, 
We got stalagmites uh, that are going to put down traps and things like that. Uh, let's see, access an additional known ability from another breed, constrained by the breed's element. Interesting. Huh. What does he have for affinities? So apparently that's grenades, frost, scamper, and gloat in his ability. So applies prideful 2 for 70 ticks, uh, plus 1 healing per 16 ticks, 44 max health. Interesting. Um... I mean, he doesn't have a self-heal, so that might be the one I go for there. Although his grenade... Well, I would say his grenade is pretty... His grenade is useful, but also he's got area of effect poison, so there's that. But, like, the, the way that the, the cross-classing has worked so far is... It just feels really cool, you know? Um, it just feels very unique. I know it's probably not 100% unique or whatever else, but... The, the types of things that are available just feel really, really legit. Um... So as you go on, you don't exactly change into new classes, you evolve into those new classes, because you are basically committed to the bit for that new class. Uh, you have some of those uh, passives or, you know, one extra skill that you can carry along with you in some cases, but for the most part they're becoming this new class. And you're not getting stats directly up in a traditional sense. Every time they level up, they get better at being that class, but as soon as you move to a new class, you're just that new class. So how do you improve your stats? Well, uh, your stats are actually primarily improved through your items. So uh, as you're carrying along, you actually get uh, damage and health bonuses that are applied with these different items. Interestingly enough, these are also the same items that are then boiled down to make dyes uh, to then uh, recolor your people and customize them further. Um, but each of these items will, uh, will give you particular effects as you carry along. And for example, going and fighting one of those boss things that I couldn't refind again just now, uh, gave a thing that made this archer hit an absolute ton, and then combined with another skill that uh, gave him a damage bonus at an elevation, means that his fire arrows absolutely roast stuff, but let's go ahead and fight this guy. Is he a unique boss or what? This guy feels unique. I mean, there's two of him, whatever he is, um, but yeah, like, th this game is just really fascinating, and in fact, I see why they brought it to Switch. Because obviously not everyone's going to have a Steam Deck, and originally, you know, when I was uh, when I was looking at it, I was kind of expecting, I was kind of expecting the standard thing that happens when you ask for a code of just like you know, we got the PC version, we got like an infinite copy of them, you know, it is what it is. But then again, they came in with the Switch version, and I see why because ha having this in a handheld format at the end of the day gives you some crazy dreams, I'll tell you that much. Um, it's been a really, uh, just a, a really meditative ride uh, going through this game. Honestly, while there isn't a whole lot of, uh, of a story or whatever else, that's not the, like, that's not needed here, you know? Um, there we go. Let's go ahead and unnerve that guy by hopping behind him as you do. Kind of try and isolate him out of the fight a little bit. But, like, the way that the uh, the environment is constantly shifting around you, the way that you can look at the uh, the brush over there and be like, oh, yeah, that is going to make a nice fire, up, like, up this guy's ass right now. <laughs> like, the fact that every one of your moves, when you're swinging around, when you're moving, that's actually causing wind, which is moving the fire around. Like, I know that's a weird thing to get excited about. I don't care. That's awesome. Like, just the way that DOTs are handled feels so good. The way that the like the, the wind and all of this uh, simulation aspect uh, to everything in the background is handled, it feels so good. I love it. Um, so, yeah, very, very satisfying, very meditative. Um, I mean, it again... You feel this story. You don't need to... You don't need to be told a dang thing. <laughs> so... It's been, uh, it's been great to see that. Um, let's see. Oh, oh uh, so the boss fight. So, sorry, random interruption. So we saw one uh, type of boss fight so far, uh, where, you know, it was just effectively a unique location uh, kind of situation. However, there's actually a lot of different uh, types of uh, bosses that I've run into so far. Um, many of which uh, seem to be uh, multi-part fights. So, like, whether it's a small gauntlet in a unique uh, arena, or if it's... Um, or if it's just several interesting uh, different combinations of enemies and whatnot, um, there's actually a lot of uh, variety in those. Like uh, one one that I got that uh, wand from, um, essentially was almost a water map uh, where you're trying to to uh, essentially c retain control of the few places you can actually stand on in that particular map. Though I have to say they had absolutely no counter for a ton of <laughs> a ton of pushing abilities and a hell of a lot of poison arrows. So. It mostly involved conquering a few tiles and then just preventing them from ever acting again. It was very satisfying. Um, ooh. If that didn't hit my own guy, that would be very satisfying to use right there. 
I'm kind of tempted to do it anyway, but his turn's coming up, which actually probably wouldn't be so bad. He's only getting on nerve two. That so would be behind my own guy. So screw it. Explosion move. <laughs> there we go. Fantastic. That's probably a terrible idea, but whatever. We're going to do it anyway. Um, so, uh, so yeah, let's see. What else is, uh, is there to cover here? So, there is a dying mechanic. I don't mean, like, death itself. Uh, you do have the option for permadeath if you want it, but, uh, as far as dying your units different colors, I don't know if there's actually any, like, mechanical reason to do it. It seems like it's mostly for, uh, for customization and such. So, yeah. Um, like, you, depending on what items you combine, you get, uh, uh, you seem to uh, to get different kinds of uh, colors out of that to make whatever you'd like. Um, again, I don't really know what uh, what that gives you exactly, um, aside from just cooler visuals. Uh, let's see. Aside from that, uh, there's some kind of affinity mechanic uh, when it comes to your uh, to your different regions. And additionally, there's kind of some affinity uh, behind uh, some of your uh, your uh, unit actions and stuff like that. Like this guy, I believe one of his items uh, gives him uh, a, a better fire affinity for every one of his actions. So, for example, when he took that sweep over there, he actually went and set the ground on fire uh, where he uh, he did the sweep. So you do have additional customization like that as well. So it, do it isn't just simply attack up, attack down. You do have actual like affinity changes that do meaningfully change stuff. Um, I couldn't figure out what the hell was going on with that guy for the longest time. Like, this guy just went and he flexed his muscles so hard for regeneration that he set the ground on fire. Why, though? Because <laughs> normally this move just gives you a small heal and some very, very low regeneration. Um, and instead what ended up happening is that, yeah, he just set himself on fire. So it's cool to see that that's there. Um, I don't know if this is going to be too deep, but let's see. Uh, okay, it looks like it was just not deep enough. Cool. Um, let's go ahead and set this guy on fire real quick. Okay, uh, the differences in touch controls and the Switch version. I don't believe I covered that on this particular take of the video. So, there are actually some differences on the Switch controls, uh, wherein you can use the touch screen to navigate uh, to, uh, to any point that you can see. Um, so, like, for example, when you go out into your bird mode, you can just tap in uh, onto the screen and you'll automatically uh, go and navigate to that point. Uh, so it's very convenient uh, as far as uh, when you're, like, just kind of sitting down at the end of the day. You know, wife asks you to go grab something, you click on something in the distance, and then you probably come back to a random encounter, but you're also most of the way there. So, I will say it's actually been really cool in uh, that particular regard. Um, ah, there we go. That feels good. We just cleared out that area, and now it's looking all nice and amber. That's very pretty. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, we get some level ups. What do we get for you? Do we want the slam? Breaks destructible objects and pulls everybody one. I feel like we'd get some use out of that at some point. Uh, what about uh, this guy? Oh, you can rename them, by the way. Um, I, I renamed a couple of them. Like, Blender was the guy that I kept throwing forward uh, to do free attacks with a sword. Um, Lingus was just a funny name. I had to leave <laughs> I had to leave that one on there. Lindel was the uh, the one guy that stayed as a goblin forever with grenades, um, and for whatever reason, he just wouldn't level up, so he just stayed with Grenade 2 for the longest time. Um, I think it's just with everybody else, I was going and uh, feeding them these field items and not even realizing it. Um, but yeah, uh, some of the other ones are just defaults, because they usually will have nature-like names. Let's see, we go into our bird mode. We got some kind of root over there, which actually, I feel like in many ways, the way that these work feels kind of similar to uh, uh, to the uh, artifacts from Stalker. <laughs> I know it's a, a deep cut here, but it's just, it 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 feels like that. that you're just kind of seeking them out to seek them out, you know? Um, and I guess one more thing I should probably mention is if there is any stutter that's actually just on account of using the uh, dock uh, here for recording, um, whenever playing on the Switch itself, it is silky friggin' smooth. And actually, on that particular note, I have to mention that this is one of those ones that's uh, really well optimized in that particular regard, um, to the point where it does not burn battery at all. Like, yesterday I was, um, let's see, in total, like, I, I had gotten up uh, when the kids were uh, were getting ready for uh, getting ready for school, you know, was uh, making sure that they were all ready to go, uh, did a little bit of, a little bit of testing of this game, um, had gone and uh, was waiting in the uh, the uh, the line at uh, at their school uh, for about another uh, 30 minutes or so, and uh, was going and, you know, playing it some more then. Uh, had had come back uh, 
ended up having a few breaks uh, in between other things here and there, and once again was testing it a little bit more. I uh, had gone back to wait in the, in the uh, line a second time, and uh, oh boy, that is a lot of stuff. And yeah, didn't... Uh, once again, it was like half an hour or so. So it didn't end up, uh, it had a little bit more time there. And then spent another probably like two and a half hours at the end of the day playing it a little bit more. And same old thing, uh, this morning when I go and take a look at the battery, I was about to go plug it into charge. 56%. And for those that have ever played on an original Switch, that is ridiculous. Like, the Switch has, like, original launch model Switch has some pretty friggin' doo-doo battery life. So that is really, really good. Um... So definitely a, uh, a testament to good optimization there. Um, man, I'm trying to figure out where the hell... I will say one minor criticism. I don't know what on earth this map is meant to signify. <laughs> I have no idea what's going on here whatsoever. Because, um, like, I look at this map, it tells me absolutely nothing. It seems to update whenever you revisit town to tell you where you've been and where your little resting areas are and where your home bases are. I think it's intentionally meant to be kind of a crappy map because, uh... Like, you, you can kind of sort of move around it a little bit. It's all meant to be hand-drawn and everything. <laughs> I think that doorway uh, down there in the very center of the map is that uh, that fight that I couldn't actually uh, get through that one time. So, either way, it's a... As strange as this sounds, this is going to be a deep cut for, like, three people that don't know what on Earth I'm talking about. But this gives me a very similar headspace to, uh, to Aquanaut's Holiday. Uh, it's this old PS1 game where you... And granted, don't get me wrong, Aquanauts Holiday, not a very good game, but it's a very <laughs> specific headspace uh, where you're just kind of traveling around and doing stuff for the sake of seeing what's out there and just appreciating the little details along the way. Like, sometimes you would just stop and make little pinging noises so you could go talk to a clam. Again, very, very strange game. I don't know what what got in somebody's coffee that morning to uh, to cause them to make it one of the like advertised titles for the PS1 back in the day, but who knows? <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, wow, that uh, that last respawn respawn point is way <laughs> back there. I think that, maybe that's the tower I was looking for. <clears throat> But anyways, no, uh, just that that kind of uh, mentality of just exploring for the sake of exploring, you know? Um, it just feels very satisfying. Like, it just feels like a very calm experience. Like, sure, you can't technically lose a fight, but it doesn't get you in... Well, I mean, you can lose a fight, but I mean, you you don't game over for losing a fight. Uh, you basically game over when you quit. It's kind of got that almost uh, Dark Souls vibe to it for that particular, uh, that particular reason. Um, but... <sighs> Like, you, you're playing as long as you want to. You're playing it just to see what's new, to see what's going on, like, what's different in this world, what, like, how you're affecting it and whatnot. Um, you're seeing these weird designs, like, this is, this is a sylph. The fairies are basically yellow starfish. Like, just stuff is weird, and you're just seeing stuff to see stuff, you know? It, it doesn't have to make a whole lot of sense. The not making sense is kind of the point, I think. Um, it's just an absolute acid trip of a game, and I love it. So, yeah. That's kind of neat. Um, so would I recommend it? Absolutely. This thing's cheap, and I know I've gotten a hell of a lot of entertainment out of it, so, you know, there's that. Um, for any of y'all that are ever wondering, by the way, if you ever heard, uh, you know, like, somebody would make a video out of something and mention that something was on their wait list for absolutely forever, and then, you know, would still recommend it anyway, even though it, they themselves took absolutely age to get around to it, it's, it's, it's basically one of these things where you only have so much to throw at so many different projects, so when you end up hearing that, you know, there's like 30 different games you're supposed to try because <laughs> the genre can't stop farting out new entries, you know, it's, it's going to be difficult to get to some stuff sometimes. There's only so much time and effort to throw at stuff, so either way, I was, like, I'm, I'm really glad for, uh, for the opportunity to have covered this one. Like, this is, this is a really cool experience. <laughs> um, so yeah, I uh, would definitely uh, would definitely recommend this one. Um, it, like if it's been on your backlog, I know a lot of us are looking forward to a certain thing on March eighth right now. But like, I'm just saying, this is going to be up a lot of folks' alley. <laughs> so uh, would definitely uh, would definitely say to uh, to keep an eye out for it. You know, um, especially for uh, for y'all Switch folks. 
Um, if you have a Steam Deck, yeah, I would, I would assume it would give a pretty similar experience. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it definitely does feel very appropriate on the Switch, which is just... It's not something that I really was expecting going into this. Um, because, you know, the Switch obviously has, has its drawbacks, battery being among them. But, um, but yeah, th this felt very right on the console. Um, like, it, it felt very... Uh, like, for, for the longest time, obviously, I was covering Tactics Ogre on uh, on the console, and I loved that game to pieces, but it never quite felt right because of the D-pad situation. Like, it just felt like a thing that didn't use the right control scheme for that particular thing. It still does the job, but it still felt like something was a little bit off there. But, like, I honestly can't imagine playing this uh, on, on uh, mouse and keyboard, but absolutely uh, can uh, can see playing this uh, on Switch uh, to a near-endless degree here. Um, one thing I will note, actually, speaking of mouse and keyboard, I did test uh, whether or not using a USB mouse would do anything. Um, as far as I can tell, it doesn't seem to, so if it's supposed to, it doesn't... I, I don't think it's meant to. The touchscreen was meant to replace the mouse controls, from what I understand. Oh, that was such a good ramp. <laughs> yeah, when you, do, when you do the skiing stuff right, it feels so good. They're still coming after us here, but I think we might just be able to get to this thing. There we go. Got it there just in time. Just before all the, uh, the enemies hit here. Now they just got a few little... Uh... What are you? Why are you so... Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I think we're about to find out. <laughs> I don't know what that is, but it's ginormous, and I want to fight it. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's felt like so many of the designs up to this point have had that feeling of, like, I don't know what it is, but I'm gonna kill it. <laughs> it's just got that really, uh, really cool feeling of, like, uh, just wanting to fight everything that's in front of you. Um, oh, there we go. So, let's see. What we got from that guy was a pale peridot. A rough flake of foggy olive green peridot. These peridots are useful for, to suppress the weeds creeping and choking. To truly rein in the tireless, uh, tireless weeds, one must apply other forces. That sounds like exactly what I don't want, because I keep liking setting everything on fire. So if I have anything with a massive Earth Affinity, that is a lot of potential flammability. <laughs> Ooh, and that looks like a town. Maybe? Or just weird-looking trees? I don't know. But, but yeah, so that's kind of the loop here. I mean, if this looks like the kind of thing you're going for, it's the kind of thing you're going for. It's a very hard-to-describe game, but... Uh, Certainly a unique one. Um, so yeah, very uh, very solid experience, very well made for uh, what it's trying to do here. Very, very trippy, and uh, yeah, really like it. So that's about that. Y'all have yourselves a good one. Um, I was hoping to run into one of those gigantic god guys or something, but you're mostly exploring around and stuff just sort of happens. So I'm sure somebody has it mapped out somewhere, but... Uh, but yeah, I haven't really run into those particular guys this time around. So, thank you for stopping by, um, and yeah, I will see you in the next one. Later.